This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. The Road to Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 22 Important Arrivals. First entered a band of rills from the Happy Valley, all merry little sprites like fairy elves. A dozen crooked nooks followed from the great forest of Burzee. They had long whiskers and pointed caps and curling toes, yet were no taller than Button Bright's shoulder. With this group came a man so easy to recognize, and so important, and dearly beloved throughout the known world, that all present rose to their feet and bowed their heads in respectful homage, even before the high chamberlain knelt to announce his name. The most mighty and loyal friend of children, his supreme highness, Santa Claus, said the chamberlain, in an awed voice. "'Well, well, well! Glad to see you! Glad to meet you all!' cried Santa Claus briskly, as he trotted up the long room. He was round as an apple, with a fresh rosy face, laughing eyes, and a bushy beard as white as snow. A red cloak trimmed with beautiful ermine hung from his shoulders, and upon his back was a basket filled with pretty presents for the Princess Ozma. "'Hello, Dorothy!' "'Still having adventures?' he asked in his jolly way, as he took the girl's hand in both his own. "'How did you know my name, Santa?' she replied, feeling more shy in the presence of this immortal saint than she ever had before in her young life. "'Why, don't I see you every Christmas Eve, when you're asleep?' he rejoined, pinching her blushing cheek. "'Oh, do you?' "'And here's Button-Bright, I declare,' cried Santa Claus, holding up the boy to kiss him. "'What a long way from home you are, dear me!' "'Do you know Button-Bright, too?' questioned Dorothy eagerly. "'Indeed I do. I've visited his home several Christmas Eves.' "'And do you know his father?' asked the girl. "'Certainly, my dear.' "'Who else do you suppose brings him his Christmas neckties and stockings?' "'With a sly wink at the wizard. "'Then where does he live? "'We're just crazy to know, cause Button Bright's lost,' she said. "'Santa laughed and laid his finger aside of his nose, "'as if thinking what to reply. "'He leaned over and whispered something in the wizard's ear, "'at which the wizard smiled and nodded as if he understood.' Now Santa Claus spied Polychrome, and trotted over to where she stood. "'Seems to me the Rainbow's daughter is farther from home than any of you,' he observed, looking at the pretty maiden admiringly. "'I'll have to tell your father where you are, Polly, and send him to get you.' "'Please do, dear Santa Claus,' implored the little maid, beseechingly. "'But just now we must all have a jolly good time at Ozma's party,' said the old gentleman, turning to put his presents on the table with the others already there. "'It isn't often I find time to leave my castle, as you know, but Ozma invited me, and I just couldn't help coming to celebrate the happy occasion.' "'I'm so glad!' exclaimed Dorothy. "'These are my rills.' "'pointing to the little sprites squatting around him. "'Their business is to paint the colours of the flowers "'when they bud and bloom. "'But I brought the merry fellows along to see Oz, "'and they've left their paint-pots behind them. "'Also I brought these crooked nooks, whom I love. "'My dears, the nooks are much nicer than they look, "'for their duty is to water and care for the young trees of the forest, "'and they do their work faithfully and well.' It's hard work, though, and it makes my nooks crooked and gnarled, like the trees themselves, but their hearts are big and kind, as are the hearts of all who do good in our beautiful world. "'I've read of the rills and nooks,' said Dorothy, 
looking upon these little workers with interest. Santa Claus turned to talk with the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman, and he also said a kind word to the Shaggy Man, and afterward went away to ride the sawhorse around the Emerald City. For, said he, I must see all the grand sights while I am here and have the chance, and Ozma has promised to let me ride the sawhorse, because I'm getting fat and short of breath. Where are your reindeer? asked Polychrome. I left them at home, for it is too warm for them in this sunny country, he answered. They're used to winter weather when they travel. In a flash he was gone, and the rills and nooks with him, but they could all hear the golden hoofs of the sawhorse ringing on the marble pavement outside as he pranced away with his noble rider. Presently the band played again, and the high chamberlain announced, Her Gracious Majesty, the Queen of Maryland. They looked earnestly to discover whom this queen might be, and saw advancing up the room an exquisite wax doll, dressed in dainty fluffs and ruffles and spangled gown. She was almost as big as Button Bright, and her cheeks and mouth and eyebrows were prettily painted in delicate colors. Her blue eyes stared a bit, being of glass, yet the expression upon Her Majesty's face was quite pleasant and decidedly winning. With the Queen of Maryland were four wooden soldiers, two stalking ahead of her with much dignity, and two following behind, like a royal bodyguard. The soldiers were painted in bright colors and carried wooden guns, and after them came a fat little man who attracted attention at once. Although he seemed modest and retiring. For he was made of candy, and carried a tin sugar sifter filled with powdered sugar, with which he dusted himself frequently, so that he wouldn't stick to things if he touched them. The High Chamberlain had called him the Candy Man of Maryland, and Dorothy saw that one of his thumbs looked as if it had been bitten off by someone who was fond of candy. And couldn't resist the temptation. The wax doll queen spoke prettily to Dorothy and the others, and sent her loving greetings to Ozma before she retired to the rooms prepared for her. She had brought a birthday present wrapped in tissue paper and tied with pink and blue ribbons, and one of the wooden soldiers placed it on the table with the other gifts. But the candy man did not go to his room. Because he said he preferred to stay and talk with the scarecrow and Tik Tok and the wizard and Tin Woodman, whom he declared the queerest people he had ever met. Button Bright was glad the Candy Man stayed in the throne room, because the boy thought this guest smelled deliciously of wintergreen and maple sugar. The braided man now entered the room. Having been fortunate enough to receive an invitation to the Princess Ozma's party, he was from a cave half way between the Invisible Valley and the country of the gargoyles, and his hair and whiskers were so long that he was obliged to plait them into many braids that hung to his feet, and every braid was tied with a bow of colored ribbon. I've brought Princess Ozma a box of flutters for her birthday. Said the braided man earnestly, and I hope she will like them, for they are the finest quality I have ever made. I am sure she will be greatly pleased," said Dorothy, who remembered the braided man well, and the wizard introduced the guest to the rest of the company and made him sit down in a chair and keep quiet, for if allowed, he would talk continually about his flutters. The band then played a welcome to another set of guests, and into the throne room swept the handsome and stately Queen of Ev. Beside her was young King Evardo, and following them came the entire royal family of five princesses and four princes of Ev. The kingdom of Ev lay just across the deadly desert to the north of Oz. And once Ozma and her people had rescued the Queen of Ev and her ten children from the Nome King, 
who had enslaved them. Dorothy had been present on this adventure, so she greeted the royal family cordially, and all the visitors were delighted to meet the little Kansas girl again. They knew Tik-Tok and Billina, too, and the Scarecrow and Tin Woodman, as well as the Lion and Tiger, so there was a joyful reunion, as you may imagine, and it was fully an hour before the Queen and her train retired to their rooms. Perhaps they would not have gone then, had not the band begun to play to announce new arrivals, but before they left the great throne room, King Evardo added to Ozma's birthday presents a diadem of diamonds set in radium. The next comer proved to be King Renard of Foxville, or King Dox, as he preferred to be called. He was magnificently dressed in a new feather costume, and wore white kid mittens over his paws and a flower in his buttonhole, and had his hair parted in the middle. King Dox thanked Dorothy fervently for getting him the invitation to come to Oz, which he had all his life longed to visit. He strutted around rather absurdly as he was introduced to all the famous people assembled in the throne room, and when he learned that Dorothy was a princess of Oz, the fox king insisted on kneeling at her feet, and afterward retired backward, a dangerous thing to do, as he might have stubbed his paw and tumbled over. No sooner was he gone than the blasts of bugles and clatter of drums and cymbals announced important visitors, and the high chamberlain assumed his most dignified tone as he threw open the door and said proudly, "'Her sublime and resplendent majesty, Queen Zixi of Ix, his serene and tremendous majesty, King Bud of Noland, her royal highness,' THE PRINCESS FLUFF. That three such high and mighty royal personages should arrive at once was enough to make Dorothy and her companions grow solemn and assume their best company manners. But when the exquisite beauty of Queen Zixi met their eyes, they thought they had never beheld anything so charming. Dorothy decided that Zixi must be about sixteen years old, but the wizard whispered to her that this wonderful queen had lived thousands of years, but knew the secret of remaining always fresh and beautiful. King Bud of Noland, and his dainty fair-haired sister, the Princess Fluff, were friends of Zixi, as their kingdoms were adjoining, so they had travelled together from their far-off domains to do honour to Ozma of Oz on the occasion of her birthday. They brought many splendid gifts, so the table was now fairly loaded down with presents. Dorothy and Polly loved the Princess Fluff the moment they saw her, and little King Bud was so frank and boyish that Button Bright accepted him as a chum at once, and did not want him to go away. But it was afternoon now, and the royal guests must prepare their toilets for the grand banquet, at which they were to assemble that evening to meet the reigning princess of this fairyland. So Queen Zixi was shown to her room by a troop of maidens led by Jelia Jam, and Bud and Fluff presently withdrew to their own apartments. "'My, what a big party Ozma is going to have!' exclaimed Dorothy. "'I guess the palace will be chock-full, Button Bright. Don't you think so?' "'Don't know,' said the boy." "'But we must go to our rooms pretty soon, to dress for the banquet,' continued the girl. "'I don't have to dress,' said the candy man from Maryland. "'All I need do is to dust myself with fresh sugar. "'Tick-tock and I always wear the same suits of clothes,' said the tin woodman. "'And so does our friend the scarecrow. "'My feathers are good enough for any occasion,' cried Billina from her corner." "'Then I shall leave you four to welcome any new guests that come,' said Dorothy, "'for Button Bright and I must look our very best at Ozma's banquet.' "'Who is still to come?' asked the Scarecrow. "'Well, there's King Kickabray of Dunkiton, 
and Johnny Dewitt, and the Good Witch of the North. But Johnny Dewitt may not get here until late. He's so very busy. We will receive them and give them a proper welcome, promised the Scarecrow. So run along, little Dorothy, and get yourself dressed. End of chapter twenty two.